Okay, so we're going to start off with two halachas of Lashon Hara, and the reason why I'm doing this now before every shear is because I recently met a woman who um, suffers from, um, she has the machala, she has cancer, and um, she asked women to take upon themselves possibly something, so I said, okay, we're going to take upon ourselves to learn two halachas of Lashon Hara before we start every shear, and it should stand as a schut. For Kla Yisrael, amongst them, Refua, Refua Shlema, for Chagit Renana Batzara. Amen. Okay. Chagit Renana Batzara. Refua Shlema. And today's shiur is, I was, uh, I received a little bit of some very difficult news last night. Um, the doctor, the professor that took care of me in NYU in the States, my, he was the head of the department of the MS Center in New York, passed away yesterday. It was very sad for me. He was angelic, to say the least. Angelic, angelic, angelic. The man suffered from, I think he had cancer in his stomach for three years. He suffered so greatly. He was not more than in his early 50s. Such an amazing, amazing man. So everything that we, um, all the chizik that we gained today, Bezat Hashem should stand as the Louis Nishmat. I don't know his exact name, but he's Dr. Yosef Herbert. Allah wa shalom. May his neshama rest and bask in the divine radiance amongst all the tzaddikim who have departed from this world. Amen. Amen. Okay, Lashon Hara. From the time we were exiled from our land, we have been praying and longing each day that Hashem may at last redeem us, but our prayers have not yet been answered. There are many sins responsible for the length of the exile, but the sin of Lashon Hara rises above them all. Since the exile was caused by Lashon Hara, the redemption cannot come until we correct it. Number two. Hashem will not, rest his will not rest his blessings upon us while we defile ourselves by speaking Lashon Hara. After he has, he has written an explicit curse in his Torah against those who speak Lashon Hara in addition to the other curse curses often involved in Lash Lashon Hara as discussed below. Our sages tell us that the damage wrought by Lashon Hara is inestimable. Estimable. When a person contemplates the te teachings of our sages from the Gemara and Zohar, which discuss the terrible effects of Lashon Hara, he is horrified by its atrocity. Zat Hashem, we should safeguard our mouths mm -hmm. and speak only Divrei Torah, Divrei Kedusha, Divrei Emuna, right? Hemanti ki adaber. Okay, so this week's Parsha, Parsha Shmot, the book of redemption, that is Zat Hashem. Um, I would like to talk about the whole idea of exile, of galut. We spoke a little bit about it. Um, it's sort of a bit of a continuation from last week's Parsha. You can look on TorahAnytime.com and um, hear what we spoke about last week, uh, which was concealment and exile. This is sort of a continuation because it really is sort of a continuation. Um, let's look and see what galut is and why it is that we have to go through it. And what are the ramifications? What are the, what, how does it affect us? What does the galut do to us? And what can we do to try to break forth from this darkness that we're in right now? So let's just understand that galut is depicted as <coughs> and described as darkness. But it's not darkness that is a new creation. Darkness is, the sages teach us, the absence of light. Okay? So what it means is, is that when the, the, the correct way we, we understand the teaching sur, sur mira. Sur mira means ex, take yourself away, remove the evil. And what happens? Asetov. Automatically, when we stop ourselves from doing, you know, involving ourselves with negativity, automatically what will surface? Positive. Positivity, positive attitude, positive thinking, and so on and so forth. It's a matter of just taking away the covering. And that's what darkness is. Darkness is a covering. Rev light is not a new, something new. Light means that that which was concealed is now easily seen. And so when we're saying about us, when we're talking about survival skills in the Galut, surviving in the darkness, what we're a actually saying is, I don't really have to do anything but stay away from negativity. Stay away from anything that blocks the light from coming forth. Because what does it say? And we're going to see this later on. Hashem mechadesh betuvo 
כל יום תמיד מעשה בראשית. Every day Hashem renews מעשה בראשית. So we're going to talk about this later when we talk about the divine speech also being in exile, according to Rabbi Nachman's teachings. But what we see here is that there's always goodness flowing down. There's always goodness. There's light. We just need someone to reveal it. It's like, oh, there's light here? Oh, who put the cover on there? Does anybody take off the cover? Wow, where did that come? It was here. It was here all along. And that, that is, in essence, what the geula is. That's what the redemption is. Redemption is taking off the veil. It's taking off the cover, and then you look behind curtain number one, and what do you say? What? Those flowers, those gorgeous exotic birds, those beautiful... That was behind my... I thought it was just a wall all the time. It just looked like some, some wall, some block. Look what beauty. Look what beauty was hiding behind there. And so it'll, there won't be any free will because it'll be so visible. Here, we could see that, that beauty. If we can just, and we're going to talk about this, how we could distance ourselves. Try as best as we can to distance ourselves from negativity and from blockages and layers of concealment. So I want to talk about two very, very interesting lessons that we learned from this week's Parsha about the idea of, let's read the Pasuk, Now it came to pass in those many days that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed from the labor and they cried out and their cry ascended to Hashem and Hashem heard their cry. I want to extract two or three lessons from this amazing piece in this week's Parsha. So there's many different commentaries. Okay, was it new Paro? Was it not new Paro? Was it, you know, what, 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 what exactly went on? What happened when Paro died? <coughs> Did he die? And so on and so forth. So let's talk about two very, very interesting lessons that we can, again, I like to extract from it and learn from it today in our world. What does it mean? Now, let's understand. The Jewish people were enslaved. They were in this state of mind of being enslaved. What does it mean to be enslaved? To be enslaved means to be stuck in our current, current reality. When a person's a slave, he feels like he has to perform certain things against his will. That's what enslavement means. No, liberation means I'm doing something, I'm not benefiting from it, I'm doing it for someone else, and I feel compelled and forced to constantly do it over and over and over again. That was the Jewish people mentality. They felt, that's it, we're stuck. Let's take it a bit out of the whole idea of the physical enslavement that Paro had them in. But I'm talking from their mindset. From their mindset, the Jewish people felt, that's it. Hashem gave up on us. We're lost in this reality. We're stuck here. They believed in the limitation. They didn't believe that they were worthy to pull themselves out of the current reality. And how many of us can see this in our own lives? How many of us are stuck in a place where we feel, how am I going to take myself out of here? I mean, it's this problem after this problem, and you're just stuck in that negativity. Constantly stuck at looking at the negativity, and you're not able to pull yourself out and say, I don't want to live this reality anymore. Yes, I have the difficulties. I still have the same problems with my, my spouse or my children, God forbid. The money problems are still there, but I choose to look at things differently. I want to now not believe in my limitations, but to believe in being free from, being, from lo looking at everything. What is Mitzrayim? Narrow-mindedness. I don't want to just look at my situation and only see black. There's a whole world out there. There's so much more. There's expanded vision. I want to be able to see life for its entire beauty and not just be stuck in the four corners of my home. There's much more to be thankful for. There's much more to embrace. There's much more to cherish. And so this was the problem with the Jewish people at the time. They believed, that's it. I'm stuck. I don't believe I'm deserving of anything else. This is the, this is the reality. I'm not going to... And what happened? They became mute. They became numb. Their senses were deadened, and they didn't even bother to cry out. And so, and, and look what it says. It says specifically, and the children, they sighed from their labor, they cried out, and their cry ascended to Hashem. So what is it teaching us? That unless we don't cry, unless we don't demand from Hashem, Hashem, we are in exile, enough is enough. People, oh, women all the time say to me, are you allowed to say that? Are you allowed to say to Hashem, Ad Matai? 
it sounds like brazen, like chutzpah, like, like I'm, I'm cha Yes, you're allowed to. Yes, you demand a change in reality. Hashem, I refuse to live in a concealed reality. I refuse to be stuck in this enslavement of believing that you created me in a world of darkness and there's no good to it. There's no justice. There's no good. There's no happiness. And I'm stuck. No, no being stuck. The whole idea of Jewish, of Yiddishkeit, of Torah living is freedom. So now let's, let's understand this just for a minute. On one hand, and I don't know if I'm jumping, and if I am, I'll suddenly realize it in my notes. But on, on one hand, you've got all of these non-observant Jews, or even obser observant Jews, that still feel that the world out there, right? What did the Jews do after they left Mitzrayim? They still had the slave mentality. Mm -hmm. Thinking that it was so enticing, how easy it was. Yes, we were whipped, but you know what? Our food was prepared. We didn't have to, you know, we worked. We knew what to expect. In other words, there is a sense of, I know my misery, leave me alone. I don't want anything new. Misery feels comfortable to me. I know what to expect. I know that this is what it is. And sort of we don't, we'd almost rather stay in the misery than the unknown change. Yes, okay, change might be good and probably will be good, but it's different. It's different. I don't know if I want to experience difference. I feel comfortable in my surroundings. And is that when you talk about secular people, is that because it's a muscle that they've never used? That spiritual muscle, is, they've never used it. So they actually don't know how, unless you start using it, right. you can't, you're like blocked. You're like right. Frozen. Well, this is what we're going to talk yeah, about. It's from people who are stuck. Right. That's, that's why that's I, that I actually means, corrected but myself. Start using it. Mm -hmm. You use a muscle if you don't start using it. So but it's like a sense stuff. of also the control that you were talking about when speaking about the anger, because if when you know what to expect, you have a certain there sense you of go. control. Absolutely. And if you don't know what to expect, it's all in Hashem's hands. That's right. That is exactly so. But that is the koach. That is the power Hashem gave us. That we are partners in creation. And that doesn't mean just creating and what, what's with outside of us. It's creating my own, carving my own path. I, if I cry out and I say to Hashem, I don't accept this reality. You brought me a child and I don't want to have all these difficulties with the child. I, uh, for instance, uh, this is one thing that I, I'll daven a lot for. Hashem, you gave me a child. <coughs> there, my son is expected to learn Torah. He has difficulties learning Torah. I demand that you help and open up his mind so that he will understand Torah. You brought him in this world. He's expected to do Torah and mitzvahs. How can he serve you if he doesn't understand what he's learning? I, I'm, I, Hashem, you must change reality. You must change reality for me. I will not accept my son not understanding Torah. I want him to, I want him to cherish. I want him to relish. I want him to swim in, this, in the honey. The honey pool called Torah learning. I want. How can he... How, I, I say it in Hebrew, like, without your help. Right. Yeah. How can he? It's very hard to, to give him, like, an ultimatum. It's sure. not an, it's not, it's, if you know that there's no one else that can help you but Hashem, right. then you go and run to no, him I like a beggar. Time, I if, I, listen, if, listen, okay. No, no. I know a lot of people don't think that they could do that. I'm not saying it be chutzpah. I love you, Hashem, and I know you're a kol yachol. You're the master of the universe. You're the big boss of the entire existence. But if I'm knocking on that door and I know, mamish, I know, I live in that reality. If that person behind the door does not give me a cup of water, I'm doomed. I'm dead. I'm falling on the floor right here in front of her door. I'm, I'm doomed. That's it. I'm done. How am I going to, how am I going to ask for that water? That is how we have to approach Hashem. I'm doomed without you. There's nothing else. There's no possibility of salvation without you. It depends on how you look at it. Again, I'm not say, I'm coming to Hashem and I'm saying to him, Hashem, you are the only one. Nobody else. Nothing. There's no other existence. No one can help me. Not Ritalin and not a million Ritalins. Nothing is going to help me. Only you, Hashem. And I put my trust in you. Open the path. I know I have to act and interact in this world on a natural way. Sh give me the right doctors. Give me the right answers. Give me the right homeopath homeopathic way. Whatever it is. But only you can show me that. Only you. Okay. So, I always want to do that and I try and do it. But then I heard that first you have to say thank you. Then you have to praise Hashem. And then you ask for what you want. So by the time it's like exhausting, you're like, oh, if I have to do that, I'm just not going to bother. Well, first of all, how better, long does it, it, it take? To just... No, no. Okay. Thank you, Hashem, for this beautiful neshama that you've entrusted to me. Just 
She's just a wonderful Neshama you've entrusted to me. But I can't do this without you. I can't bring her up without you. I can't do it on my own, Is that the way I do it? Okay, so first of all, there's, uh, Rabbi Nachman says 23 hours of simcha, mm -hmm. of all accepting in gratitude, one hour you can fetch. <laughs> one hour you could quetch. Uh, 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 it's okay. better to quetch than to not talk to her. No, no, no. Well, you could, no? if you no. Okay, there's a difference between. Oh, sorry. No more. Oh, no, no, no. Mine. Mine. Your hand was mocking your face. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because I met someone at Best Market and she looks at me and she's like, "Is that really you? <laughs> <laughs> You're a celebrity." And I said. Uh, I, I, I felt so uncomfortable. I said, no, 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 no. She says, what, you live here? Yeah. You live here in Ramat oh, Bochemish? She, I, she said, yeah. Right. She said, I've been watching you. And your, your Shereem is so amazing. I can't believe you're living here. Where do you live? I'm like, on En Gedi. She said, why do you live on En Gedi? And I didn't even, so it's, I'm, I almost feel like I want to do something like this. You know, like, uh, anyway, so, uh, Baruch Hashem. Now, Lecha Hashem Agdula. So, so the Indian is, so you could take two approaches. First of all, all day long, all day long, all day long. Thank you, Hashem. 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 And then you, you know, come to him. And I'd say an hour. We spoke about this before, Lior, Lior and I. It's hard an hour. Just have that moment of Yeshuvah Dot where you're sitting with Hashem and you're really opening up and you're just asking for help. Okay. Then, on the other hand, you could do the two together throughout the day. Reb, Reb, Reb uh, Natan Zatzal, how would he daven? Hashem, 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 what amazing children you gave me. Absolutely amazing. And guess what? You gave them to me with such a hefty appetite. They love to eat. They love to eat. Hashem, I need a little bit more parnasa just to feed them. They're such great children, but I need money to feed their beautiful appetites. That's connecting the thank you to I know it's all from you. So it, who you are, if you don't think you're going to have that hour's time to fetch, then, then do it throughout the day. Yes, the thank Oh, quick. It doesn't, we're not talking about, Shem, thank you, thank you, thank you. Da, 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 you know, washing our dishes, thank you. Da, 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 but I really, really, really need your help. Uh, if I don't get your help, I, I tend to use the, ter the, the words, Shem, if you don't help me now, I'm going to fall. And I don't want to fall. I don't want to fail. I don't want to fail. I want to do your will. Help me. Keep me up. Only you can lift me. You're my pillar. You're my staff, right, that I need to lean on. Only you. I have nobody else. Where am I, where am I going to go, Hashem? Where am I going to go? Help me collect myself together so by the time the kids come in, I'm not yelling at them. It's not their fault that I don't have money to, you know, cover this bill or that. It's not their fault. Please help, help me separate it. You know, constantly knowing that it is him, no one else. Okay, so the idea is, and I totally lost my place. I have no clue what I just was going to say. <laughs> right, so it is an idea of realizing that we have to open our mouth. We have to cry out. We have to open our mouth. We have to cry out. And we have to demand Hashem to bring the ge'ula. We have to demand Hashem to bring ge'ula. No more. Hashem, no more. Right? Mm -hmm. No more. Number two, another lesson we could take from this is a totally different approach. Something very, very interesting that I learned from the Zohar HaKadosh. The Zohar HaKadosh says, what does it mean that a new paro emerged on the scene? What does it mean? It means paro in terms of a new kingship, a new ruling, a new governing, so to speak. But the governing not on a physical plane, but right here. Suddenly the Jewish people took upon themselves as if they were being led by a new mindset, a new governing of mind of thinking and such. What does that mean? It means that they became used to the place of being in a place of whiny and crying, and they, but they weren't doing anything to try to take themselves out of it. They weren't, it's not just enough for us to cry. We, we do, we have to interact into this world. We need to, to do things within, in this world. We can't just say to Hashem, Hashem, send me the Yeshua and not do anything. We do have to do something. But the idea is we have to understand <coughs> that it's tefillah, and understanding that Hashem has this ability to change things as long as we co-partner with Him and we uh, interact with Him in order to bring it about and so that it's sort of masked in our hishtadlus and not put into a, a format of, of miracles, okay? Now what happens is in, in, in this particular place, 
Hashem put, uh, put us in a situation, Am Yisrael is in a situation where the governing of our mind has to be such that we have to always remember that we're here to do Hashem's will. Our job in this world is to constantly fulfill Hashem's will. We have what's called Koach Yehudim. We have the ability, the spiritual Koach, to create unification, spiritual unifications, to connect everything. By, when I say everything is from Hashem, I'm essentially making spiritual con connections. I don't know if I said this over here, something very interesting in Eretz Yisrael. We, what do we call Eretz Yisrael? We call it Admat Kodesh. What is Atmat, Admat Kodesh? Is holy land. What is holy? Shemaim. What is land? Ground. Mm -hmm. In Eretz Yisrael, we have the most ideal <coughs> setting to, to create what we call Yehudim. To bring what's up above and what's down below and merge them together and create what's called spiritual Yehudim. And so Hashem put us in a position where we must do His will. What happens? The Zohar Kadosh t t uh, teaches us. What happens when we stop doing His will? It's written, Ki yim loch. If we don't choose Hashem's ruleship over us, Hashem puts nations that will rule over us. Measure for measure. Hashem says, you're not going to do my will. I'm going to make you do someone else's will. Someone else is going to tell you how you can build in Yerushalayim. Right? As we're experiencing now, someone else is going to tell you what you should be doing with your, um, you know, uh, funding, what you should be doing with the people, you know, being elected on, in the next government. We're constantly <coughs> going to have someone rule over us. So we better choose. It's better to choose Hashem. And so, what do we learn from here? Is that the cycle, the cycle is such. We don't do Hashem's will. Hashem put somebody over us. Now what happens? The Goyim know that all of the Shefa, all of the abundance <coughs> from the world that comes into the world, how does, how does it come? We're the Tsinor. We are the pipeline. And so the Goyim know that everything's going to come down from the Jewish pipeline. And so what happens? The minute there's a clog in the pipeline and no, the abundance stops and there's financial problems in the world or there's fights on the home front, or whatever problems come, why do they right away come and blame us? Because exactly this. Because it's our fault. It really is our fault. And that's why they get angry at us. They get angry at us. You're not doing your job right, <coughs> you Jewish people. You should be doing your job because if you were doing your job, this world would be a great place. If you're not doing your job, Oh, it's clogged, and only a Jew is the plumber that can actually un unclog that, that pipeline. The Zohar Kadosh. The Zohar Kadosh brings it, brings it down. Huh? They don't know. It's saying it. It's subconscious. It's subconscious. But you wonder, oh, it's always a Jew's fault. Yeah. It actually really is always the Jews' fault. Sorry, it really is our fault. Yeah, that means the Jews have never ever done their job because it's always been out of service. Thank you. That's, well, we have enjoyed peace. Yeah. Shlomo Amelech. I mean, we've, we've yeah. had our moments. We've, we've had our moments. We've had our moments. We've had our moments. Unfortunately, this is the, and this is where we're talking about. We constantly are getting pulled by the enticement of the Goyim and the materialism and all of their flares and fanfare and we're thinking, that's the life. That's the life. What am I doing being stuck in my imprisonment? But what we don't understand, and here's the point I want to bring out. The point that I want to bring out is that what, who does it? If anybody has someone who's not observant in their family or knows of someone, the first thing that they say, the, I know I have, it's the first thing they say is, but I love, life is good. I'm doing really good. I don't need anything. I don't need your to I don't, God forbid, I don't need you. Like, I know you're happy, but I'm happy in my life. I can be a good person Yeah. Torah. Right. Okay, the good person is, is old school. That's like, yeah, I know what you're saying. I, I get that too, right? I don't need Torah to refine my... Yeah, no, that's it. But I have it really good. But if they only knew, and this is, this is the amazing learning that, I, that, I, that fell into my lap, is if they only knew what happens is this abundance that they're getting is an enslavement. Why? Why are they enslaved? And what, what did we say before? What happens when you're enslaved? Nothing stays with you. 
Nothing stays with you. It goes to your master. Who is the master of the one who doesn't keep Torah? Who's the master? Sitra Achra. Mm -hmm. The Yetzahara, the other side. Do you know that Ra Rabbi, um, Rabbi Wallerstein Shlita, he brought down an amazing, amazing teacher. I don't know anyone ever heard his shear that he spoke about of his problems with gambling. He, I, I could say this, it's not Lashon Hara because he, he, he publicized this. He said that w one day, you know, he was, he was kept trying to not gamble and yes gamble and not gamble and he kept going back and forth, back and forth. One day, he had really made a decision, I'm not going to gamble anymore. And he found himself sitting in a shul in between Mincha and Marev and he picked out a book and I think it was the Kli Yakar or Kavayashar, I don't know, one of the mm -hmm. holy books. And he opened up and what did he find out? He opened up particularly to that place, and this has exactly to do with what we're talking about, to the place where it says, if you go into a casino and you gamble and you win, <laughs> you will be sued by the Sitra, not you, they will be sued by the Sitra Acha after 120. The Sitra Acha will come over to him and say, I gave you my money. Give it back. Mm -hmm. You give it back. It doesn't belong to you. You were my slave. I gave it to you as a bonus because I'm your master. And so that person literally will pay due to the Sitra Ahra. And this is exactly what we're talking about. This is exactly what we're saying. Is unfortunately, and, and, and again, I'm not here pleased. Hashem, Hashem, in the schut of today's shiur, everyone should come back to tshuva. We're not, we don't want that to happen to anybody. That's not what I'm implying. But what I'm here to say is that I know it's hard to explain to them, but for us to logically understand, they are enslaved. These people are unfortunately enslaved because they look at the enticement, but what happens? Eventually, we all know. Do you know that the biggest population that seeks therapy because of emotional issues is the Jewish population? Does anyone know that? Mm -hmm. If you look at the percentage, it's more Jewish people that seek <coughs> therapy than the Gentile nations. Do you know why? Because the Jewish people are acting a, acting a certain tafkid, they're, on a, they're hired, they're as if doing, performing a certain job in this world, that they're not meant to be working. What, how horrible is it when you're working in a job, you're working in a job that you hate? Isn't it hard? You're miserable. Right. That's the Jew. The Jew is living a materialistic life, thinking it's all enticing and amazing, and they're miserable because they know they're, high, they're a high-ranking official, they're made of royalty, and they're working, cleaning what, I don't know, you know, cleaning, I don't know what. And they know inside that their, their potential is for greatness, and they know they're not doing what they're, what they're meant to be doing. And so it's this grandiose shell, and inside, it's all hollow. There's nothing there. And so Hashem created the Jewish soul to yearn. And to not be satisfied, right? The flickering of the, of, the, of the flame. But it was meant by purpose was to seek Him. And if we're feeding it materialistic food that all the soul wants is holiness, of course it's going to be empty. It can't digest an apple when it really needs Torah. Mm -hmm. Even an apple. You cannot feed something that just doesn't belong in that vessel. And so this is, this is the problem of the Jew, is that we get enticed, we get caught up in the negativity, the coarseness of the materialistic world, and we get put in, and that, those in essence are those shields. Those in essence are those blockages, those veils that stop the light. But again, who created it? it Hashem brought, it's, uh, where did I, I wrote it down here somewhere. I don't even, I, I can't look at my notes because it's too many lines. But basically, Hashem, it says, Chochma, yesh. Shefa, yesh. Everything, there's everything. There's shalom, there's wisdom, there's abundance. Everything is here. We are stopping it from coming down. We are the ones that are creating this by what? By the Mitzrayim that we are enslaving ourselves to live. We are putting ourselves in this narrow path. I just want this world. I just see the needs of this world. And so there's no room for anything else to come in. And in essence, I'm saying to Hashem, I don't need anything else. I'm okay with what I have. But eventually, unfortunately, ends up biting us back. And we do end up finding ourselves in this hollow, hollowness. And so this is the time to cry out to Hashem. 
This is the time. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to get to a point where we become so enslaved in our current reality that only then will we let out that heartfelt depth cry, that in what, what I call the inside sigh that turns into an external cry. That, that inside pain suddenly takes the form of being this cry of, I, I need a change here, Hashem. Where are you? Okay, yes, yes, it was me. It was me. I shut you out. But right now, I want, I want out of that. I don't want that anymore. I'm sick of being enslaved. I want my personal redemption. I want my personal liberation. I want to be free. And so, Be'ezrat Hashem, I mean, that's something that we all have to keep in mind. Now, let's understand another thing. Hashem is made of, uh, the, ne the, the name, the Kabbalistic name of, of Hashem is, is Or Ensof, right? The Ensof, the, the beyond, the beyond the limitation. And so we all, because we have a spark of godliness, each one of us also has our own personal Ensof. That place that we know that can, we can always extend more, we can always do more, we can always go beyond. And that's vital for us to constantly understand, again, if we're in a position where I just don't <laughs> feel satisfied, where I don't feel like I'm living, I'm living the, 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 I feel still empty, I feel like I still need to be doing so much more. We need to do more. That's where it comes from. It comes from this point of ensof, this point of no limit, of infit, in, infitness, in, in, <coughs> infinity, <coughs> sorry, infinity, where I know that I am connected to a boundless, endless ray of, of existence, and I need to constantly look to yearn. And understand, if we don't look to, to fill it, then unfortunately the Sitra Ahwa comes in and says, oh, you're running on dry, why don't you get a new car? Why don't you build a new home? Oh, you need an extension. Oh, maybe, you know, change your refrigerator. I know it works good, but, you know, maybe you want to upgrade it. I'll let you see that new thing with the new gadget. And always trying. You're always, if you notice, if we notice the pattern of life, we're constantly trying to renew, to bring upon, to change, to grow. But we're doing it sometimes and many times, unfortunately, in the wrong direction. So something that we need to be very, very, um, cap you know, very aware of. The last point I wanted to bring out was the whole idea of Hashem's divine speech, which, which I said, you know, I wanted to talk about. That Rabbi Nachman brings down an amazing, amazing insight about what it means, Shechinta Begeluta. What does it mean that the Shechina is in Galut? What does it mean? So it doesn't mean that Hashem's Hashgacha is in Galut, is in exile. It doesn't mean anything else but that Hashem's speech, <coughs> what is speech? <coughs> His speech is in exile, the Rabbi Nachman brings down. What does it mean? When I talk to someone, what am I actually doing? I'm putting into expression that which I have inside. My thoughts, my feelings take physical, tangible place. It's expressed in a way that I can communicate. So it's a thread through speech. I thread a communication between myself and the one that I am talking to. <coughs> that in essence is the divine speech. The divine speech expresses Hashem's intent and His will in creating the world and bringing it into existence. And that's why it says, let there be light, right? Let there be light. What does it actually mean? It's taking the words it's taking Hashem's intention and will, and it's putting it into physical existence. So through Hashem's speech, physical reality takes place. Okay? So we understand that. So when we say that the divine speech is in exile, what are we actually saying? We're saying two things. One, we're saying that Hashem's intention, Hashem's will, is in exile. We find ourselves in Galut, a lot of times asking questions. What was Hashem thinking? What was Hashem thinking? What, what, what is, how could there be logic here? How could there be good here? Where, like, no matter how much I would try to turn it around, switch it over, how is it that it shows any good? I just don't see it. There's no possibility. So that's one of the things that unfortunately happens in, in our state where, we, where the Shrinta, uh, you know, the divine speech is in exile. And the second thing that Rabbi Nachman brings down that goes into exile is Hashem's call out to us. Let's understand that when Hashem said, let there be light, those words echo 
every single day anew. Every single moment that there's light, it's Hashem's speech going over and over. Let there be light, let there be light, let there be light. The minute Hashem stops, so to speak, saying, let there be light, no more light. Okay? The, his speech, so to speak, is what keeps reality and existence constantly going. And so the idea is, what are, how are we going to conclude today? Is we said that Hashem is constantly talking to us. Hashem is constantly appealing to us. But because we're so involved in the, in the shell of reality, of the physicality of this world, it again serves as sort of like this blockage, this barrier. And so if I understand that the idea that I don't hear Hashem talking to me is part of the idea of the Shrinta being into, in Galut, then I'll understand that, it, wait a minute, so Hashem is actually calling out to me. Hashem is actually speaking to me all the time, every day, all the time. The fact that I'm in existence means Hashem is saying, so to speak, Ori, you're alive. Ori, you're alive. Ori, you're alive. Or Constantly, he's talking to me. He's constantly, because that's how I'm alive. I'm, I'm in reality because he is speaking me to be in reality. What does that mean? It means that it's my job, of course, to start as best as I can tearing down these, you know, these uh, barriers. And that was one of the things going back a couple parshiot of Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu was the first one who was able to detect Hashem calling out to him, Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha. That was his greatness. His greatness was not that Hashem spoke to him. It was that Hashem, that he heard, that he heard. That means there were no barriers. There were no barriers between Hashem because he heard Hashem's voice. Every single one of us can hear Hashem talking to us. Every single one of us has a personal lech lecha message being sent out to us every moment of existence. The fact that I'm here, Hashem is all the time talking to me. But in order for me to hear his voice, I have to remove myself. And I'm getting, I don't want to make this about, okay, don't enjoy this world, and then I usually get bashed on the head. What do you mean? I can't go to the mall. I can't break away. I can't buy myself a gorgeous necklace or something or another. What do you mean? I you can't enjoy this world at all? No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying just understand that if we get too involved in the physicality of our existence, it will muffle the voice of Hashem. It's just a scale. There's nothing, that's the way the world was created. There's materialism and there's spirituality. And if you, you can enjoy more material. I didn't say no, but many times none of us are on such a level that we can really look at physicality and say, no, it's all the Shem Shemaim. It's really hard. In fact, as I heard of a tzaddik once who said, that he, they asked him, where do you want to be buried? And he <coughs> said, bury me anywhere you want as long as it's not, it's not next to someone who's rich. I don't want to be buried next to someone who's rich. Why? Because chances are they had such a difficult nisayon. It was so difficult for them to overcome, you know, that I, the idea, the challenge of looking at materialism and using it for the sake of spirituality. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't remember the name of the tzaddik, but, but the, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real source. Again I'm, not here, again, I'm not here to say, God forbid, don't enjoy what you have, but just know, ex embrace it, accept it, and understand that it's a great challenge. And it may, unfortunately, stop us from being able to really feel close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, And that is the galut. That is the coarseness. That's the galut. You can have both, but it's, it's, it takes a lot of awareness and of boda and to feel Hashem, please don't let me get carried away, don't let me get carried away. Let me use it, let me use it, mamash, let me use it. I, I, I'll be honest with you, like I sometimes even think to myself, you know, and I see myself, you know, in my house it's always feast or famine. You either have or we don't have anything. And I see at the times where, even me, you know, with, where, where, I, what is even me? God forbid, I shouldn't say that, you know, I mean, because I don't... But I'm saying, like, I work on, I truly do, I try to work on myself. And I see, I have a, I splurge, so, you know, so I put that extra thing in the carriage. It's very, very, it's really hard. It's really hard not, not to get carried to away. Right, and I do try. <laughs> but it is, it's really, it's a hard nisayon. It's really hard. But it's really hard, because money is power. That is the way. What do we enjoy about money? What do I enjoy about money? Huh? Uh, of course. But it's, I'm saying, of course that is our avoda, but it's hard to do it. 
It's really, really hard. Why don't, why does Rabbi Kanievsky and, and the uh, Rav um, um, <coughs> Steinman, why do they live? Do you know that they're living on the same bed as they had 50, year, 50 60 years ago? Do you think that they have a problem getting money? It's not that they're not interested. I'm sure. It's not that they're not interested. They're scared what it's going to do. That If they're scared what the way it's going to change them, who are we? Who am I? Who am I to say that if I have 10 more shekels in my pocket, it's, I'm not going to be swayed a little bit more to... And again, I mean, some people say, oh, come on, give me a break. Really, really, you got to get to that point. I don't know, what do you want? What do you want from life? What do you want from life? Uh, it's, it's here, though. It has nothing to do with what I see. It's not the houses I see. It's the galut is in the mind. It's exile of the mind. It's what I'm thinking. If it, Listen, I heard of once an amazing vart by an amazing Rav, Rav Lugasi Shlita. And he said, he says, just because... I went up to Shemaim and I didn't have anything. It doesn't mean I didn't have a taiva for chomriyut, for materialism. Just because Hashem didn't give me the means to be able to go out and buy that amazing mansion, it doesn't mean that I wasn't attached to materialism. Just because I lived in a house that was broken down and torn down and, and, and totally broken out, it doesn't mean that I don't have a taiva of material. It just means I, don't, I can't afford it. So we have to understand, just because I live in a very tenua home, I have very tenua clothes, very broken down car, and I really don't have money and I have minus in my bank, it doesn't mean I'm not materialistic. It's here. Do I, do I feel, oh, it would be so nice if I just had, if I just had, I would buy, mm, I would do, mm, I would, mm, no. You understand what I'm saying? It's in the mind. Do I feel <coughs> like I don't have it because I don't have it because I don't have the money to buy it, or do I feel I don't really need it because mm -hmm. I don't? That's that's going to take me off of my purpose. Mm -hmm. It's going to strain me away. Into the ruchnias, what the superficial is what's overtaking. That that's the narrow mindedness. That's exactly the matzar. I created my own journey, and there's no room for spirituality, and it's only this world. And so that's the danger of it. That is the danger of it. And so, again, I, this wasn't meant to be a sheer talking about materialism and, and, and spirituality, but we need to be aware of dangers, of the road signs, the road, you know, warning road signs that are lying ahead. And, uh, you know, again, everyone has to be honest with themselves. We have to ask, what do I really want in my life? What do I really want? Do I, re do I understand this life is a vestitude? It's really a passageway. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I have this you know, plate or that plate or this designer shoe or that designer shoe. It doesn't matter. Do I, do I, do I live in that reality? Because that's, in essence, what's putting me in further into my galut. That's what's putting me further into my Do I look at physicality as really just a means or as a, an end goal? Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's a question we need to ask. Is let the we should be matzliach and really see the full revealed redemption, every single one in their personal way, on a collective way. Bimhera, amen. Amen.